Hello, and welcome to Piper's Paraphrases. I'm Professor Pipes, and this week I'm finishing up a Christmas carol. Fa la 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 la. Okay, fine. I meant Charles Dickens' famous novella, A Christmas Carol. This week I'm covering staves three through five, but before I jump right in, let's review what was going on last time. <laughs> in A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge was being, well, a Scrooge. He was rude to his nephew, whose only crime was inviting Scrooge over for Christmas, rude to his clerk, who had the audacity to request Christmas Day off work, and rude to a couple of men who wanted Scrooge to donate some money to charity. Bah humbug, he says. Fortunately for Scrooge, a ghost had his back. Specifically, the ghost of his former business partner, Marley, who was filled with regret and advice. He warned Scrooge not to be such a selfish jerk like he was, and told him that he would be visited by three spirits. The first of these spirits, the ghost of Christmas past, took Scrooge on a trip down memory lane. They watched a sad, lonely little Scrooge by himself at school. A slightly older kid Scrooge spending time with his little sister, who is now dead. A happy and loving young man Scrooge enjoying a Christmas party with the best boss ever. A slightly older young man Scrooge being dumped for his greediness. And then that ex living her best life as a happy wife, mother, and grandmother. Watching all of this made our protagonist a bit sad and, dare I say it, maybe even regretful. Which is where we left off. Stave 3 opens up with Scrooge waking up and discovering that it's magically 1 a.m., yet again. And therefore, time for the next spirit. So he waits. And waits. And nothing happens. Soon, he realizes there's a mysterious light coming from the next room. And sure enough, it's haunted by the ghost of Christmas present. No, Cooper, not that kind of present. He's a giant and happy spirit with enough food to feed a him-sized party. Mmm, Christmas cake. Surprisingly, Scrooge says he's ready to learn from this Santa-esque figure, so they head out. The spirit blesses the houses as they go along, and soon they're at Bob Cratchit's very humble home, where Mrs. Cratchit is cooking and waiting on her husband and a couple of kids, while the others help her get ready for Christmas dinner. Soon everyone arrives, including Bob and his young son, Tiny Tim, who is sickly and uses a cane. They all settle in and thoroughly enjoy each other's company and their meal. And the cherry on top of this familial perfection is Tiny Tim's oft-quoted, God bless us, every one. But just as you might have been getting all those warm fuzzies, here comes Dickens to spoil your day. And Scrooge's, as the spirit reveals that if things don't change, adorable little tiny Tim will soon die. Did I mention this is a Christmas book? When Scrooge is horrified by this news, the spirit snarkily quotes Scrooge back to Scrooge, saying, Tim should hurry up and die and decrease the population of poor people. Scrooge's musings are interrupted when Bob offers up a toast to Scrooge himself. Wait a minute. A toast to the jerk who barely pays him and to guilted him about taking a day off for Christmas? The man who hardly will even give him a lump of coal for his fireplace? Less than Santa gives the naughty list kids? Mrs. Cratchit's sentiments exactly. But the family's inherent kindness and generosity win out and they toast to his health. Soon, Scrooge and the spirit head out and visit the places where one might think Christmas is the last thing on people's minds. The homes of laborers and miners, and even out to sea. But, sure enough, they're all celebrating too. Then, whoosh, they're at his nephew's house, catching Fred mid-laugh as he recounts to his family and guests how rude and ridiculous his uncle was with all his bah humbugging. Instead of getting angry at his meanness or jealous of his wealth, 
they pity him. And Fred vows to go and bug him, more like humbug him, every year in hopes that maybe, just maybe, he might learn the true joy of Christmas. Or at least pay Bob Cratchit a little more. Yeah, you go, Fred! Then they all sing and play music and games, and even Scrooge joins in on the fun as he watches, even when they playfully make him the butt of a joke. As the night moves onward, Scrooge notices that the spirit has grown old. But before he makes his final departure from the world, he pulls out two horribly monstrous children, the children of man, ignorance, and want. And he warns Scrooge to beware, for they spell doom, doom. Then, poof, all three of them disappear, replaced by a mysterious hooded figure. Dun, dun, dun. Which brings us to stave four and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. He's a man of few words. Well, no words, actually. And he points the terrified Scrooge onward to some truly depressing visions of the future. First, they overhear a couple of groups of people, familiar to Scrooge, who are talking and even joking about some man who finally died, but whom none of them will miss. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Next, they see some very poor servants talking casually about what they stole from the horrible old man who finally died. Scrooge is clearly horrified by how little they cared for the dead man, and even says that, Oh my goodness, the dead man's situation could possibly, maybe be sort of, kind of a little bit like his own. Real quick on the uptake, this guy. They then visit the room of the dead man, but Scrooge is too terrified to look at the body, so he asks to visit someone, anyone, who has any kind of emotional reaction about the man's death. Be careful what you wish for, Scrooge boy. They see two people who are emotional. They're thankful, perhaps even overjoyed, that the man is dead, because it means that their loan will be handled by someone hopefully less awful. Scrooge and the spirit move on to the Cratchit's house, where the family is waiting for Bob to arrive, but sadly, without Tiny Tim this time, who has died. The whole family is clearly upset, but trying to focus on the positive, including some kind words from Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Next, Scrooge asks to visit his office, only it's no longer his, and someone else is working there. Again, Scrooge really isn't connecting the dots here. They move on to a graveyard, where Scrooge finally comes face to face with the inevitable, his own grave. And suddenly he puts it all together and realizes he was the horrible old man no one missed, no one mourned for, duh. Scrooge begs to know if it's too late to change the future, but receives no answer. Surprise, surprise. Despite this, he vows to keep the spirit of Christmas in his heart forever and to be a better person. Yay! And this brings us to the final short chapter, Stave 5. Scrooge wakes up thankful for the lessons of the spirits and Jacob Marley and just flat out happy to be alive. He's so dang happy, he doesn't know what to do with himself. And he goes dancing about throughout the house and eventually runs to a window and calls down to a boy in the street asking, what day is it? The presumably confused boy tells him, uh, it's Christmas. So Scrooge gives him some money to go buy the biggest turkey in the shop so he can send it to Bob Cratchit's family for Christmas dinner. Then he gets all dressed up and heads out, happier than a kid in a candy shop, greeting everyone around him with cartoonish joy, including one of those men who had asked him for money the day before. So Scrooge promises him a huge donation. He makes it to his nephew's home and enjoys the happiest Christmas imaginable. But our Merry Christmas doesn't end there. The next morning, when Bob arrives late to work, screw Jack's mad, but then reveals it's all a joke and vows to raise his salary, fill up his fire, and help out his struggling family. And he does, saving Tiny Tim in the process. From then on, he is known as one of the best, kindest, most Christmas-spirited men ever, a man we should try to live up to. 
A Christmas Carol is an allegory, which means that the characters are symbolic. This is done in many ways, including the spirits themselves, who represent exactly what they say they represent. The past and memories, demonstrated by that ghost's shifting appearance as memories themselves shift and fade. The present in all its extravagant and generous glory, showing that the present really is a present I had to. And the future, which can seem ominous, especially when you're as selfish and uncaring as Scrooge has been. However, since the characters are symbolic in an allegory, this often means that the characters and the themes are intertwined, with some characters demonstrating flaws of humanity and others representing the good of both people and Christmas. I've got it. Let's call this the naughty and nice list. Santa would be so proud. The symbolism and themes are obvious with characters like the children who are literally named Ignorance and Want, which are both definitely on the naughty list. The Ghost of Christmas Present warns against them, especially Ignorance, which he says brings about doom. He says that it's important to stop those who spread ignorance since, if admit it for your factious purposes, everything gets worse. Warning us about fake news even back in the 1800s? So ahead of his time. Since Christmas is supposed to be a time of togetherness, giving, and gratitude, it makes sense that Dickens would warn against the ignorance that breeds division and the want that fuels selfishness. Speaking of togetherness and gratitude, let's look at the characters who represent these nice qualities. From the start of the story, Fred's whole goal is to bring Scrooge back into the family, wanting him to join everyone for Christmas. In fact, in his jovial and friendly spirit, Fred says that Scrooge's choice to isolate himself is that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts. Fred knows that, at Christmas more than any other time, it's important to be with those you care about, including Scrooge. And speaking of Scrooge getting more than he deserves, let's talk about the Cratchits. Even though they don't have much, they are still joyful and are grateful for what they do have. For instance, when they see their Christmas pudding, everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. The narrator also points out that their humble tumblers hold drinks as well as golden goblets would have done, showing how, though we may not always have what we want, it's important to be grateful when we have what we need. Even in the Christmas future that Scrooge sees where Tiny Tim has died, the family makes it a point to be happy. Happy for what they had in Tim and happy for what they still have with each other. In addition, the Cratchits give a face and a sense of humanity to those dealing with poverty, reminding the upper classes that those who die or go to prison because they don't have what they need are real people who demonstrate and deserve compassion. In fact, despite Scrooge's awful treatment of Bob, the poor clerk raises a toast to Scrooge, whom he calls the founder of the feast. Even Mrs. Cratchit eventually agrees to wish Scrooge well, saying that it should be Christmas, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. Okay, not super nice, but even compassion has its limits. The compassion and empathy this family shows and deserves is set in harsh contrast with Scrooge himself, especially when we consider how everyone spoke of Tiny Tim's passing when compared with how people talked about dead Scrooge. I guess that means it's time to talk about everyone's favorite Christmas jerk-turned-good-guy. I can hear the song now. 
You're a mean one, Mr. Scrooge. You really are a heel. Oh, wait. That was the Grinch. Eh. Same difference. Scrooge, of course, is a symbol for the greed and selfishness Charles Dickens saw in society, particularly in the upper classes. Scrooge has become almost irredeemably villainous, so much so that the only people who feel anything about his death feel happiness or relief. It isn't until Scrooge sees the selfish greed in others that he truly feels disgust as he watches a trio of people talking about stealing from a dead man, him, without a sense of guilt. As the charwoman said, every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. But the result of this selfishness was a lonely, unmourned death. In this future, Scrooge has died a greedy man, the complete opposite of what the spirit of Christmas present has to offer. Generosity. So Scrooge frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit others when he was dead, instead of profiting others when he was alive. However, Charles Dickens wanted people especially those with the power to make a real difference, to learn their lessons and do just that. So this is precisely what happens to Ebenezer Scrooge. He is moved to change, not only because he looks with new eyes on his past actions, like in the previous chapters, but also because he is able to look at himself through the eyes of others. In doing so, he recognizes the effect that his actions have on those around him and what effect they will have on himself and others in the future. Realizing no one cares that you're dead? Yeah, that's got to be a real eye-opener. He also sees what life could be like if he let togetherness, gratitude, compassion, generosity, and love into his life. So Scrooge decides that he will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Because that isn't just what Christmas is all about. It's what makes life worth living. <laughs> Heading out for the holidays, let me leave you with some food for thought. Consider these questions as you review the story. First, what is the significance of showing smaller characters, like the miners at Christmas or the poor thieves stealing from Scrooge? What might Dickens have been trying to say? Second, what is Dickens saying about wealth? Is it complex or simple? Can it be used for good as well as evil? Third, the ghost of Christmas present quotes Scrooge back to himself more than once. Why? What purpose does this serve? Fourth, this story is both comic and horrific, filled with laughs and ghosts. How does Dickens use both humor and horror to teach lessons? And finally, why do we, to this very day, recreate this story with greedy network executives, talk show hosts, publishers, cartoon ducks, and even Muppets? What makes A Christmas Carol so iconic and timeless? Thanks for watching this episode of Piper's Paraphrases. Now go forth, read a bunch, and be good people. And, as Tiny Tim would say, God bless us, everyone. Thank you.